Welcome back to the Freedom Unchained channel. We're going to continue with Lesson 6 from George Gordon, Common Law School. If you haven't watched it from the beginning, please go to the playlist and watch it from the beginning. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you guys want to actually learn what true law is and not what that fake fiction that the government makes up and they force you to believe. And they have indoctrinated the good little school boys and girls to uh, obey. Because here on Freedom Unchained channel, we're going to teach you common law, which is actually the law of the land, which is expressed by the Constitution. Common law is a process of getting to understand right from wrong or in a court setting who is right or wrong. Please leave a comment. Let's get a conversation started. Smash the like button. Help the algorithm out. Share this video around to all your friends and uh, family that uh, haven't caught on to this lie yet of the judicial system and their immoral games they play with people. And I hope you guys and I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. And let's just get to it. Well greetings again. We're on lesson six today, and we're shooting live and direct in a courthouse here in Idaho. And we're calling this the Smith County Courthouse. And I'm going to cover these subject matters today and we're going to act out with some actors that we brought in from our school and show you the right way and the wrong way to conduct your arraignment, bail setting hearing, the trial itself, preliminary hearings, uh, motion hearings. If you'll take a look at your course outline, you'll see that hearings and types come in bail, arraignment, probable cause, control of the court, how the court proceeds and how the accused should proceed. And the first thing we want to talk about is control of the court. Because as a salesman, I know that if I cannot control the conversation, I cannot close the sale. And the judge and the prosecutor are simply salesmen in the courtroom closing the sale. The salesman that was out on the street is called the policeman. And he's issued you a ticket. He's given you a summons into an administrative proceeding to take your money from you for a product or a service. And that service is the law enforcement growth industry. And so you're a customer of the law enforcement growth industry for the purpose of protecting the claims window of the insurance industry, or for promoting the sale of alcoholic beverages or hair stylists or beauty colleges or barber shops or whatever business interest in the community, you're there to protect that interest. And when you violate any of the commercial code, rules, or regulations, you're brought into an administrative proceeding called trial or court. Whether or not you're at common law or in equity will depend upon the rules of the courts and the law, whether it's common law or whether it's equity law, the king's statutes in your particular state or locality. If you're in Idaho, what you're talking about here in a traffic court is an equity star chamber proceeding of summary judgment. It's a summary proceeding. No jury is actually required or needed. And I think beginning next year, or maybe it's later on this year, we're going to change the traffic code from misdemeanor to a thing called infraction. An infraction is simply a word used by the insurance industry to describe an easier uh, less difficult way to take your money away from you and to punish you for breaking the commercial code. You're not at law. Remember the 222 rule. You have equity and common law. Then under equity and common law, they're both divided into civil or criminal. And if it's criminal, then it's got to be a misdemeanor or a felony. So when you're talking about the misdemeanor, you're talking about a period of time, a particular grade of punishment. And so the traffic court rules are, and regulations run under that subject matter, that title of misdemeanor or uh, infractions. And we're going to convert misdemeanor to the word infraction. I challenge you to look in your constitution and find infractions. I think you can find felonies, infamous crimes in the Fifth Amendment and misdemeanors, but I don't think you're going to find some of the terms that we are now using in the United States and in our state of Idaho to describe private law and the enforcement of commercial contracts. So today, 
What we're going to cover is the correct and the incorrect procedures, and I'm going to comment upon each one of these actors as he comes before Judge John W. Curtis. Judge Curtis is going to preside, and he's going to run this traffic court the way we run them here in Idaho. If you're in Illinois or Portland, Maine, or Texas, they may be run somewhat differently. But essentially, the Constitution of the United States is the prevailing document, the prevailing law in all common law matters. It's either an issue of rights or an issue of contract. And when you go into that courtroom, when you're in a traffic court, when you're in the small claims court, you are not at common law, friend. You are in equity. You're in the old king's star chamber. And that star chamber is Roman mercantile law. And Roman mercantile law acts upon contract. Specific performance. Why didn't you do what you agreed to do? And so the question always has to revolve around, well, how did the court gain jurisdiction? And we're going to talk about the jurisdiction today. And we're going to talk about the contract today, the evidence of consent into a regulated enterprise. And we're going to put Judge Curtis on the spot. And we're going to ask him, and we're going to make demands upon him. So let's take a look at how the arraignment proceeding goes. And so now let me introduce the judge, Mr. John Curtis. Hear ye, hear ye. The traffic court of Smith County, Idaho, is now in session. The Honorable John W. Curtis presiding. Be seated, please. This is the 130 session of the Smith County Traffic Court, February 19, 1983. We'll take up the arraignment calendar at this time. Before we begin, I want to advise all of you of your rights in this court. You have the right to an attorney to represent you in all phases of the court procedure. If you cannot afford an attorney, an attorney will be appointed for you. If you want to engage your own lawyer, you may request a continuance for one week, and the court will continue your case for one week while you obtain your attorney. Anything you say is recorded here and may be used against you. At the arraignment, you may plead guilty or not guilty. If you plead guilty today, I can listen to any explanation you have to make and pass sentence on you today. If you plead not guilty, we cannot try your case today, but it will be set for a later date, and you may request a jury trial or a court trial. If you request a court trial, the matter will be tried before an experienced trial judge and, and will take only a few minutes. However, if you demand a jury trial, you will have to post a trial bond of $150, and you will have to engage a lawyer. <clears throat> a jury trial costs a lot of money, and it takes a whole day and is quite complex. Now let's have the first case. Let's see, is Mr. Tony in the courtroom? Donald Tony? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's see, we have here, let's see, three Idaho Uniform Citations. We just must have the wrong one here. Here we are, Mr. Tony. Let's see, we're charged with failure to register a vehicle, with failure to carry a certificate of insurance in the vehicle, and failure to carry a driver's license. Do you understand these charges, Mr. Tony? Yes, sir, I do. And how do you plead to these charges? I'll have to plead guilty. You plead guilty. You understand, of course, if you plead guilty, you give up certain rights. You give up the right to confront any witnesses. You give up the right to cross-examine witnesses. You give up the right to, uh, to an appeal. If you, uh, you plead guilty, we can sentence you immediately, and uh, we can just have it over with right now. <clears throat> yes, sir. Do you still wish to plead guilty? Yes, sir. Yes. Let's see. Uh, do you have a driver's license now, Mr. Uh, yes, sir, I do. I went down and renewed, and they, they were lost. And Could I see it, please? Here, Your Honor, that uh, I have a date by your law. This is current driver. How about registration on your vehicle? Uh, have you my current wife registration? I care of that. She registered it, and I, uh, I wasn't able to find it, but I'm sure it's registered. Uh, 
And how about insurance? Do you have a current insurance on it? Uh, well, yes, sir. I would. Uh, it's, it's a little expired. I mean, I didn't know that she takes care of that or do, and uh, I was trying to let her handle it. I see. I don't have to handle it from now on. So you have. Uh, Current, you have current uh, insurance, and you do have a driver's license now. Your automobile, you don't have proof of registration of it here, though. Yes, sir. But you do have proof of registration? No, sir. Oh, I, I don't have it. No, well, <clears throat> Mr. Tony, I'm going to have to find you uh, $10 on your driver's license and $10 on your insurance, but for your registration, since there's no proof of it, I'm going to have to find you $50. So that makes a total of $60, and there will be $11.5 court costs for each one of these. Uh, if you'll take these out to the clerk and uh, she can take care of it, you can either arrange to pay for it now or make a promise to pay. <clears throat> uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Now let's analyze what happened here with Mr. Tony. If you've seen Mr. Tony once, you've seen him a thousand times. Parade before the court, throw himself on the mercy of the court. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Notice that we have what we call here in Idaho the big three, driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. And let me ask you a question. First of all, does our common sense tell us that if the government could compel us to buy or purchase insurance, the government then could compel us to buy water beds, automobiles, or take vacations to Hawaii, couldn't they? All they would need then is a legislative enactment called House Bill 2402, and then Senate Bill 2109, signed by the government, or the governor rather, all citizens in the state of Idaho shall, within a period of one year, take a vacation to Hawaii, can't they? Under penalty of law, and the policeman would come around and he'd knock on doors or he'd stop people in their automobiles and he'd say to them, have you got your receipt from your your trip to Hawaii, can you prove, do you have proof of vacation uh, trip to Hawaii? And if not, I'm going to give you a ticket and bring you before Judge Curtis. Now, does that make sense to you? Well, if it doesn't, there's some hope. If it does, you've got a problem. Because that kind of legislation is nothing but private mercantile law. And I would like to have that kind of private mercantile law. I want the legislature of Idaho to compel every citizen under penalty of law to buy a, uh, a course for me so that I can charge them money and teach them constitutional law. Now, our Constitution makes provision for this mercantile law. Equity isn't something that's prohibited. Citizens can become slaves if they want to. Your right to make contract is absolute and guaranteed in Article 1, Section 10. And furthermore, you can even be coerced into making contracts. And if you'll notice here, Mr. Tony produced his driver's license contract. Now, as a matter of pure uh, law, a contract, or by definition, a contract is not a license. A license is the evidence of your voluntary consent into a regulated enterprise. Well, what was the regulated enterprise? Driving on the road. How did that come into interstate commerce? Because he's got it insured. Well, now, wait a minute. He said he didn't have insurance, didn't he? But he's got the driver's license, and the driver's license, then, is his voluntary agreement that he'll obey all the laws of the state of Idaho. One of the laws of the state of Idaho is that you will buy insurance. And if the state so decreed, one of the laws is that you'll buy a vacation trip to Hawaii. Mr. Tony is a volunteer into a regulated enterprise. He signed the contract, he volunteered, and then he didn't complete the terms of the contract, did he? And so the judge is simply saying, sir, you didn't abide by the terms of the contract, and so here's a penal clause. And this penal clause is that you'll pay fifty, sixty, seventy dollars plus the court cost for administering this program. And you'll pay that, and that's to teach you a lesson. That's your your penalty for not doing what you agreed to do. Well, let's ask ourselves the question then, could Mr. Tony be compelled to do what he doesn't want to do? Well let's ask the question this way. Did Mr. Tony ever object? Did he ever 
send the driver's license back? Did he ever refuse to get a driver's license? Did he ever make a recorded demand for his rights in the county recorder's office? Did he object to the judge? When he came before the judge, did he raise any jurisdictional question? You know, failure to object is fatal. And failure to demand your rights timely waives the rights. And so here, like everyone that you know, he walked up to the judge and he pled guilty. He not only didn't demand his rights, he actually waived his rights, didn't he? Because he just wanted to come in, pay a small fine, and walk out the door. He didn't want the hassle. He didn't want to be bothered with the question of jurisdiction or right and wrong, constitutional rights. He just wanted to take the least uh, expensive, the, the fastest, most expedient way out for him today. And when we do that, we do our little bit to help create that gigantic tyranny, that tyranny that now has all of us by the throat and threatens the liberties of everyone. Because now if you don't have a driver's license, that's the crime of and by itself. You know, there had to have been a time when you could drive your horse or your wagon or your car and you didn't have to have a license. It was at that time you had the freedom to decide for yourself whether or not you wanted to have the car registered or the horse registered or the, the uh, wagon registered if you wanted to volunteer to pay taxes to use the road or not. Now, Mr. Tony then is an example of the perfect slave. He's the man who says, in effect, I can't be bothered with rights and freedom. I, I have to get out there and make a living. I've got to go out there and uh, feed my children, and I've got to make money, and we'll just let somebody else worry about that. And so we've been leaving the problem of rights to somebody else, to somebody else. And the only people that claim rights then are the Mirandas and Escobedos and the criminal elements of our society and the corporate entities in our society. And so here you're faced with all of the Supreme Court's rulings and decisions that have to do with criminals and corporations. Take a look at these corporations, and they don't have the right status to come into the courtroom and claim, well, we don't want to be bothered with driver's licenses, registration, and proof of insurance. The courts have consistently ruled, and the Constitution makes plain provision for the regulation and the taxation of corporations. And so that being the case, we have only natural persons left. Well, if natural persons are going to claim their rights, they have to have a reason, a cause, a purpose, don't they? And why would the natural person like Mr. Tony want to claim these rights when all he has to do is plead guilty? He's only going to get caught twice this year. It's going to cost him $120 tax. But if he hired a lawyer to help him with this case, it would cost him $600 for each one. Twice a year, that's $1,200 to claim his rights and to be a free man against $120 to just give up the rights. So the government has used a lot of subtility and a lot of, uh, of, a lot of wisdom here. See, they only tax, they only oppress you a little bit. Well, let's take a look at a man then who may want to claim his rights and who may want to plead not guilty. Let's see what kind of a shake he's going to get in the next case. And so let's watch what happens to the next citizen. And this one is going to demand some rights and he wants a jury trial. Let's see, our next case here is Claude Potts. Is Claude Potts in the courtroom? Yes, I am. Would you come up here, please? Let's see, Mr. Potts, we have three complaints here. One is charging you with selling beer to a minor, to wit, Mr. Trent Servatius. Second count, selling beer to a minor under 19 years, to wit, Joel Husky. The third count is selling beer to a minor under 19 years to a Charles Simonson. Uh, do you understand these charges, Mr. Potts? Yes, sir, I do. Then how do you plead to these charges, Mr. Potts? Well, I think I'm going to plead that guilty to these. 
And if you plead not guilty, we'll set a trial for a later date. But uh, do you wish a jury trial or do you wish a court trial? I think I got some rights. I think I want a, I want a jury trial on this. You want a jury trial. And uh, Mr. Potts, if you have a jury trial, you'll have to uh, post a bond of $150 and we'll set trial for. Uh, Let's see, where's the calendar here? Well, I don't, yes. I don't have $150. You don't have $150? No, I don't. Then how can we give you a jury trial if you can't post a bond? Maybe I'll just plead guilty to this. Plead guilty? What, what's, what would the fine be if I plead guilty? Well, of course, these are, each one of these is a uh, misdemeanor, and the maximum fine for a misdemeanor is $300 fine and six months in jail, so that's uh, that's a maximum. However, uh, let's see. <clears throat> I think the statute on this calls for a $50 fine for a first offense. In that case, Your Honor, I think I'll plead guilty to these charges. All right. If you plead guilty, you understand, of course, that you're giving up certain rights. You're giving up the right to confront your witnesses. You're bring, giving up the right to bring witnesses before the court, and you're giving up the right to any appeal. Do you understand that? Yes, I guess I do. You understand that? Very well, then, Mr. Potts. Uh, <clears throat> since you pled guilty and understand your rights, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to fine you uh, $100 for all three counts since this is your first offense. If you want. Yes. I don't know. I just, these guys, these kids had ID, and I didn't mean to sell them the beer. It was still, it'd be kind of hard for me to come up even with $100. And I don't remember an agreement with the court or something to pay this off. Well, if we, if we, uh, Find you. You can enter into a payment agreement with the clerk, and you can take. You can be given a certain amount of time to pay, mm -hmm. up to six months. And uh, but we understand that you uh, may have thought that the person was uh, of age, but uh, nevertheless, you did sell beer to a person under 19. And I'm giving you a pretty good break here. Your fine is only $100 on all three counts, so. If you'll just take these out to the clerk and make your payment agreement with the clerk, why that'll be satisfactory. Thank you. <clears throat> well, now we saw a man who came into the courtroom and he thought he wanted to have a jury trial. You'll find these type people every now and again. The guy's not guilty. He's innocent, or at least he thinks he is, or he's been beguiled. Now, in this case, let's analyze it a little bit and see whether or not there's any reason, logic, and common sense. He walks up to the judge and he, he says, well, I want a jury trial because I'm not guilty. I didn't sell this beer to those minors. There could be any one of four or five different explanations. These people were, were uh, sent in there and they had phony ID and they beguiled him or they tricked him or perhaps uh, he was very busy and they were standing in a line and he thought that the beer was being sold to the guy in front instead of the guy in back. And, the money was changing hands pretty rapidly. There could have been all sorts of defenses. <clears throat> In addition, there could have been a defense as to whether or not the statute applied to him. You know, if he was a natural person and he wasn't an artificial person, the statute could possibly have applied to a corporate status but not to an individual status. You know, the statutes say all persons, but it's all persons who are regulated by that statute. Now, there's another line of argument here. Where was the victim in this crime? Well, it looks like to me the store clerk was the victim, doesn't it to you? He's charged with a crime, but who was it that walked into the store and bought the beer? Did we hear in the explanation, did we go into the dialogue of the trial and see, did these people come into the store and buy the beer? Or did they come up to him and say, hey, I'm only 17. Would you uh, sell me some beer and I'll give you an extra $5 bill? That could uh, indicate that there was some crime, that there was some motive 
the profit motive here for selling the beer, which could then be interpreted as being a crime. But we didn't hear that from this fellow. And did you notice another thing? This happens quite often here in our state. The judge is saying, if you want justice, you'll have to post a $150 bond in order to get it. Well, first of all, in our state, that's prohibited by our state constitution. Justice is not for sale in the state of Idaho. Judges are like salesmen. If the judge can get a $150 bond out of you, why shouldn't he ask for it? I mean, after all, isn't that what they do to you in the store? They tell you, well, you'll have to put $150 down on this and lay away. And if you say, wait a minute, I don't want to put $150 down. I'm going to pay you cash for this. Oh, okay, well, we'll take cash, but I'm not going to give you $500. I'm going to give you $400 cash. You're wheeling and dealing, aren't you? Well, can you wheel and deal in court? Well, I don't think the average person believes that he can, but watch how this comes down. When we take a look at the next fellow who's going to come up to the court, and he's going to demand his rights. And in this case, we're going to show you a man who knows his rights, demands his rights, and is going to take total and absolute control of the courtroom right away from the judge. Because the salesman has to be in control, or he cannot sell his product. It's not possible for him to sell his position or idea unless he's the one who's dominating the conversation, unless he's the one who's in control psychologically. When we went through the jailhouse scene, we showed you that you've got to be in control psychologically in order for you to withstand the intimidation that's going to come down on you. That requires knowing the law. Well, now if a person comes up and he knows he has a right to a jury trial without posting the $150 bond, if he knows he has a right to be released on his own recognizance, if he knows that he has a right, a right, a right, and he can assert and demand those rights, <coughs> he can take control of the court, and he can dominate it, and he can obtain his rights. But if he doesn't know his rights, then he can't assert them. And if you cannot assert them, then you cannot have them. Now, I want you to take a look at your arraignment and plea. Now, an arraignment and plea is a document that in the event that you cannot walk up to the judge and speak to him orally, then what are you going to do? You're going to drop paper on him. You can always recover by paper. Anytime you make a mistake in the courtroom and you walk out and you say, oh, I wished I would have brought this up, or I wished I'd have brought that up, or I wished I hadn't done this, well, on those circumstances where you say, I wish I hadn't done this, there's no recovery. Confessions and admissions are on the record. Where you wish you had added something or done something, you can always recover by filing a motion or a brief with the court, and it becomes a part of the official court record. Now, this is a record of a case that I call the Big Three here in Idaho. Driver's licenses, registration, and proof of insurance is our big three. At this moment in time, I've won five or six of these, and I have two or three in litigation. So I'm going to go through this arraignment and plea with you, and I want you to follow along with me as we look at the elements here of the citizen who is going to come up to the judge and is going to demand his rights. Notice that we start off by saying, comes now the accused. At this juncture of time, I am not the defendant. I'm simply a person that the government or someone, some unknown person, is accusing of a crime. I'm not a defendant until we have an action, and that action begins after the arraignment. So after I'm arraigned, I become a defendant. I can always claim that I'm the accused. Actually, it's simply a matter of semantics, but at this juncture of time, I'm not making any admissions and confessions. You're accusing me of something. Now, let's talk about what it is. The accused, then, appears specially and not generally herein to enter a pleading and plea to the court. We're going to enter a pleading and a plea. Now, notice that in this court, the judge has said you can only plead guilty or not guilty. Well, what happened to nolo contendere and mute and double jeopardy? In the state of Idaho, we have four pleas. Many states at the common law have five pleas. 
Maybe you'll remember Spiro Agnew, Vice President of the United States, when charged with bribery or conspiracy. He pled no low contendery. Well, why would he do that? Well, there had to be a reason. Not long ago, a federal judge charged with taking bribes stood mute before the court in a federal case. Why would a person stand mute? Well, the judge said you had to plead guilty or not guilty. Well, let's stop here for a moment and let's talk about this thing called pleading the complaint. If you're going to enter a pleading, you're making an inculpatory or an exculpatory statement. You're saying, when you say, I plead guilty, what you're doing is saying, I understand the charges. I understand that I'm the person who did it, and I know and understand that what I did was a violation of the law, and therefore, I'm guilty. You don't need to prove intent. You don't need a corpus delecti. I'm the person who's prepared to pay the penalty. What happens when you plead not guilty? You come up before the judge and you say, Your Honor, I plead not guilty to these charges. All right, now what you're saying to the court is, I understand the charges. I recognize the jurisdiction of this court. And I'm here today to come into this jurisdiction and to grant you jurisdiction over me in personam. I understand that this court has jurisdiction over the subject matter. And I'm going to enter a plea of not guilty. I'm saying that I did not do the acts that the policeman has alleged that I have done. Well, now, you've waived a couple of very vital and necessary rights. On this next case, we're going to take a look at those in detail. All right, now, what would happen if we pled no low contender? Well, then what you're saying is these charges that have been laid against me, I'm not going to plead to. I'm going to simply allow you to administer a stipulated plea bargain, and I'm not waiving any of my rights. If at some point in the future somebody reneges on the plea bargain, this financial arrangement, I'm going to demand all of my rights, and I'm going to come back and plead not guilty or stand mute and demand that we go to trial. So there's no low contender. 